So what is the point of having the glass panel if you're just going to cover the nice cables with the cable cover? What's up everyone, Eric here and welcome to Hardware for Gamers. The Lian Li Langhul 2 Mesh is a mid-tower ATX case with an MSRP of 120 US dollars. Let's take a closer look. The dimensions of the Langhul 2 Mesh are 49.5 centimeters high by 23 centimeters wide by 48 centimeters deep. The Langkool 2 mesh does come with a small box with all the screws and fittings in it. There are also some zip ties and some extra velcro straps. There is a folded booklet. This booklet is double sided and illustrates pretty much everything you need to know about the case. There is also a second smaller booklet explaining the front I.O. ports. The Landcool 2 mesh does have a fine metal mesh front panel. This panel can be easily removed by pulling the bottom of the panel away from the chassis. The front I.O. is on the top of the case, so there is no need to worry about damaging any of the cables when removing the front panel. Taking a closer look at the front panel, there is no additional dust filters on the panel, so the fine mesh is the dust filter. Moving to the top of the case, we see the front I.O. There is a combo port for the audio out and microphone. There are two USB 3.0 type A ports. There are two LED buttons, one to control the color and the other is to control the lighting effects. There is also the reset and power buttons. Now Lian Lee Li also provides a cutout for an optional USB 3.1 type C port for an extra $15. I think. It is sold out at both Newegg and Amazon.com at the time of filming. So I was only able to actually see any third party sellers and they were charging up to wazoo for them. There is also a large magnetic dust filter along the top of the case. Moving to the rear of the case, we see the location of the rear I.O. and tooling for a 120 millimeter exhaust fan. There are seven horizontal expansion slots, all with reusable covers. You can remove all the expansion slot covers and install Lian Li's vertical GPU kit, but that kit does cost an extra 56 US dollars. And finally, at the bottom, we see the power supply location. Taking a look at the bottom of the case, there are four plastic feet. These feet allow for 28 millimeters of ventilation. The feet also have rubber pads on them. There is also a removable dust filter for the power supply. This dust filter is accessed from the rear of the case. Now moving on to the right side of the case, there are two side panels. One is steel and the other one is tempered glass. Both are held in by magnets. Now to remove the glass panel on the right side, you need to first open the lower steel panel. And you do this by pulling the small tab located at the rear of the case away from the chassis. You can then swing the glass panel open. Once the panel has swung open more than 90 degrees, you can slide the panel up and lift it away. Now just make sure when you're doing this to actually have some weight on or in the case because it is possible for the case to tip when lifting the glass panel. The glass panel is not clear, it does have a slight tint to it. Now the left side panels are very similar, so to remove the glass panel on the left side, you need to open up the lower steel mesh panel. This time there is a small groove located on the panel at the rear of the case. And again, pull the top of the panel away from the chassis. And again, you can then swing the glass panel open. Once the panel has swung open more than 90 degrees, you can slide the panel up and lift it away. And again, just make sure when you do this to have some sort of weight on or in the case, because it is possible for the case to tip. And I am emphasizing this point, so just be careful. Now it is possible to leave the glass panels on when building in the case, but I have seen enough of Linus's videos where entire builds nearly tip over, so I highly recommend taking the panels off when building in the case. Now to put the glass panels back on is pretty simple. You just have to realize that the top pin or hinge is slightly longer than the bottom one is. Now before taking a look at the inside of the case, I do buy all the products that I review myself. So if you like what I'm doing here, can you please like this video and subscribe? It helps out the channel a lot. And speaking of helping out the channel, I also have an Amazon Associates link. So if you click on one of the links in the description below and then add something to cart and order it, the channel gets a small kickback. 
Now, with all that out of the way, there is a basement, and the top of the shroud has two removable ventilation covers. These covers can hold a 2.5 inch drive, or can be removed and you can then install a 120mm fan instead. Now these ventilation holes or slats along with the lower mesh panel should allow the GPU to access a lot of air. So I'm not sure if adding a 120mm fan to the shroud will make a significant difference to the GPU temperature. But I guess it is something I can run some tests on and see if this is actually the case. The shroud also has two very large cutouts for running cables. There is also a cover along the front and by removing this cover will allow you to install 360mm radiators. Taking a look inside the basement from the left side of the case, there is a 3-bay drive cage with sleds. These sleds can hold either a 3.5 inch or a 2.5 inch drive. Now Lee & Lee does sell a hot swappable backplate for this drive cage, but that is an extra 15 US dollars. Now taking a look at the motherboard tray, there are two cutouts along the top for your EPS cables and fan connectors but most of your cables will be running through the large vertical cutout, which does have a cover. Now, this cover can be flipped, but I'll get more into that in a little bit. The Landcool 2 mesh does support mini ITX, micro ATX, and ATX motherboards. Lean Lee says there is support for EATX motherboards up to 280 millimeters in width, but the EATX form factor is not standard, so your results may vary. The maximum GPU length is 384 millimeters, but that will be cut down if you go with a front mounted radiator. And the maximum CPU cooler height is 176 millimeters. Turning the case around to look at the back side of the case, there are two 2.5 two inch dry sleds on the back side of the motherboard tray. There are also two cable covers. These cable covers are each screwed in with one screw. And FYI, these screws are not captive. So if you don't hold onto them, the screws will drop. Now behind the cable covers, the back side of the motherboard tray does have a few cable tie-offs. Lean Lee also provides two Velcro straps to help with cable management. There is also a plate meant to hold a fan hub. This plate can be moved to suit different setups. Okay, as I mentioned before, the vertical cable cutout and cover can be flipped or removed. To do this, you first need to remove the Velcro straps on the back side of the motherboard tray. Then you need to undo two screws on the front side of the motherboard tray. To flip the cutout, rotate the cover 180 degrees and then screw in the two screws. Now you don't actually have to have the cover installed, but if you don't use the cover, then you won't be able to use the Velcro straps like cable runs. And finally, there is 25 millimeters given behind the motherboard tray for cables. Moving on to the basement, there are two additional two and a half inch drive sleds fastened to the steel panel. Now that means you can have actually up to nine drives in this case. Now with the drive cage in its stock orientation, there is 216 millimeters given for the power supply and cables. Now the drive cage can be moved or removed. To move the drive cage, all you need to do is undo one screw and slide the cage along the rails. Once the cage is in the desired location, fasten the cage in place with that screw. Now to remove the cage is a little more complicated. You will first need to remove the front panel and the front fan tray. To remove the fan tray is pretty easy. All you need to do is undo two screws. There is one on each side. You will also need to remove the shroud cover. This is done by unscrewing one screw located on top of the cover. Lift away the cover. Now make sure that the drive cage is not fastened to the chassis. Then slide the drive cage all the way to the back until it's out of the rails. Then rotate it and bring it out through the front of the case. Now to reinstall the drive cage, all you need to do is just reverse everything I just said and did. So with the drive cage in the frontmost position, there is 280 millimeters for the power supply and cables. But if the drive cage is in this location, you will no longer be able to install a 360 millimeter radiator in this case. Now if the drive cage is removed, there will be just over 400 millimeters for the power supply and cables but that will be cut down if you go with a 360 millimeter radiator. Moving on to the cooling options of the Landcool 2 mesh, there are three fans pre-installed. These are all 120 millimeter ARGB intake fans at the front, but the Landcool 2 mesh can kind of support up to eight 120 millimeter fans. So that's three fans at the front, two fans along the top, with one fan at the rear, and you can also have two fans on top of the shroud. Now, if you prefer to have 140 millimeter fans, 
then you can have up to four 140 millimeter fans. So that's two 140 millimeter fans at the front and two 140 millimeter fans along the top. For radiator support, you can have up to 360 or 280 millimeters at the front. And along the top, you can have a 240 millimeter radiator when using the leftmost rails. Okay, that's it for the overview. I guess it's time to build a test system in this case. Okay, it is a few days later and I did get some help actually building the test system. Now before I get into the results of all the testing, I wanted to talk about the ARGB hub and some other things. The hub is built into the front I.O. and is powered by SATA. The ARGB connectors on the fans are not standard 5 volt ARGB connectors, so you cannot easily use them in another case. You will need a Lian Li ARGB hub or some kind of adapter. Now you can add extra LEDs to the system by using the extender connector. However, if you do want to add multiple LEDs, you will need to buy a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB splitter. There is also a connector that plugs into the motherboard to allow the motherboard to control the LEDs via the board manufacturer's software. And this hub that's built into this case only works with the 3-pin 5-volt ARGB LEDs. So the 4-pin 12-volt LEDs are not compatible. This hub has two buttons. There's the color button that cycles through seven static colors and the lighting effects button that cycles through seven lighting effects with the eighth setting turning the LEDs off or syncing the hub with the motherboard. Now you will need to plug in that three pin five volt connector into the motherboard and have the board manufacturer's LED software installed for this to work. Now, if you are synced with the motherboard, you can turn off the LEDs by holding down the lighting effects button for three seconds, and then holding it down for another three seconds will turn them back on. Another thing I wanted to talk about was the fan tray at the front, and it is adjustable. Now, the position of the tray doesn't really change the locations of the fan all that much, but it is possible to set things up to get a little bit more room inside the case. Now, when building in the case, I also noticed that the rubber pads on the feet of the case were or are leaving marks on my desk. Now these marks do come off, but really why is this happening in 2021? Okay, before I go over all the results of the testing, if you do have any questions on how I test the cases, check out my case testing method video in the card above. I'll also link it in the description and that should answer most of your questions on how I test the cases. Starting off with the CPU testing. Now there really isn't much difference between all these tests. But with the pre-installed fans, the Lancool 2 mesh had the max CPU temperature reach 53.9 Celsius. And in the fan normalized test, the max CPU temperature hit 53.2 Celsius. And with the normalized fans with no front panel or filters, the max CPU temperature hit 52.4 Celsius. Which does indicate that the front panel and dust filters are not restricting the airflow to the CPU in any meaningful way. Now when comparing the stock CPU temperature to the other cases I've tested, the Lancool 2 mesh did well, coming in just behind the Lancool 215 with the hub. And in the fan normalized test, the Lancool 2 mesh again performed pretty well. Moving on to the GPU temperatures, again there's really not much of a difference between these tests, but the Lancool 2 in its stock configuration did manage to have a lower GPU temperature than the normalized fan test with a max GPU temperature of 51 Celsius. And everything else is pretty much within the margin of error of one another, so there you have it. Now when comparing the GPU temperature of the Lancool 2 mesh 
to the other cases I've tested. Its stock configuration performed well, pretty much tying it with the Langcool 215. Now in the fan normalized test, it performed very well, coming in just behind the Focus G. So what do I think of the Langcool 2 mesh? All in all, this is a great case. Now with that being said, there are a few choices Lean Lee made that I don't quite understand. First off, the cable covers with the glass panel. The reason to have the glass panel on the right side would be to show off your cable management skills, but then Lee & Lee includes these cable covers to cover the nice cable management. So what is the point of having the glass panel if you're just going to cover the nice cables with the cable cover? Now the price of $120 US dollars leaves me a little confused because it feels like Lee & Lee landed somewhere in the middle of a workstation and a gaming station case. On the workstation side, the case can hold up to nine drives. There's EATX support. You can actually have hot swappable drives. The cooling performance is excellent. But then you also have the gamer station type things like the ARGB fans, the glass panel, and a second glass panel. Because I would think people looking for a workstation don't really care about having two glass panels, certainly not over having hot swappable drives and or a USB type C port. And I do know and understand that Lee & Lee does give options for this case. There is the white ARGB version, which is what I looked at. There is a black ARGB version. And then there is a black performance model with no RGB, which is nice to see. But all these cases still have the two glass panels and the cable cover. And again, I don't want to give you all the wrong impression rambling on like this. This is a great case. I just don't fully understand some of the choices that Lee and Lee made when choosing the components. Like the tooling of it seems very workstation, but then obviously spending so much money on two glass panels would definitely put it shit, would definitely push it into the gamer category. I don't know, maybe I'm just making too much out of this. It just feels like Lee and Lee inflated the price by adding in so much tooling to the case to try and hit the two market segments. I don't really know. But that is all I got for this one. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're still watching, please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notified whenever I drop a new video. Please follow me on Twitter at HFG underscore YT. I also have a Discord server. The link is in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching and see you next time.